course, the economy is having a number of challenges, experiences that many Ghanaians have been having for the last couple of months, if not um, about a year and a half, so to speak. And today, we're speaking on a special event because, well, somebody who has a lot more insight into how to manage private enterprise make contributions significantly to small and medium scale enterprises and their own contributions to the overall macroeconomic level of the economy will be speaking to us on a crash program well he thinks is critical to making sure the critical areas of the economy really are taken care of that is the small and medium scale enterprises and so uh, they have a special program just to make sure we rethink the macro sector of the economy and the players in there are well taken care of we're speaking to one time chief executive uh, of unilever ghana limited and also um, the managing partner or founding partner of Ishmael Yamsen and Associates, Mr. Ishmael Yamsen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having this great time with us. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to pick your thoughts on the current state of the economy. Well, the, uh, unfortunately, the economy is, is in great difficulties. Um, I'm sure every Ghanaian knows that the city has been depreciating. Um, inflation is on the rise. Um, interest rates are very high, especially for SMEs, is is simply um, unbearable. Um, if you take those just those three elements, um, the impact on the other on the ordinary person on businesses can be very severe um, and indeed uh, it's interesting that you say in a couple of months because we have seen these situations on many occasions we saw it in 1992 we saw it in 1996 we saw it in 2000 we didn't see it in 2004 but we saw it again in 2008 and 2012 seems to be maybe the worst case. Um, so for me, it, it would appear we haven't learned lessons, and maybe we are not learning the lessons. Because if we have learned the lessons of those years, why should we be in this situation again? Um, so we, we, we found ourselves in quite a difficult situation. I mean, I heard yesterday uh, the review by the IMF managing director. And, and Africa generally is doing very well. So why should we, Ghana, be on the other side of the page? Um, so it's quite a tough situation. But you, you do indeed realize that um, over the last six months, actually the projections, as far as we're concerned, uh, over the last two years for the economies that have done creditably well within the period have been that bad. Yeah. Apart from the Ghana city, yeah. um, we've had some difficulties with the South African round. Yes. And, uh, well, South Africa in Africa is the biggest economy. Exactly. And so, uh, well, if Ghana is also having those difficulties, even though not equated to the challenges of South Africa. You should say that perhaps um, they are temporary and we could get out of them. Um, the, 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 there are the external issues that we cannot simply dismiss. Um, the quantitative easing, for instance. Mm. Uh, where they are, the U.S. government put a lot of cheap money in the market. And all the countries in the emerging markets and in the developing countries all took advantage. You should also remember that we have gone through quite a, a period of very high commodity prices. So if you bring the commodity price increases together with the quantitative easing that where you got cheap credit, those economies definitely did well. But the moment they the U.S. Federal Reserve made the announcement that quantitative easing will, be, will begin to taper, which means they will stop putting cheap money in the market. Immediately, investors realized that where well, they could get better returns from the American uh, uh, economy. 
So money began to leave the emerging markets and developing markets. Hence, the problems you had in India, you had in Brazil, you had in South Africa, you had in South Korea, and of course you had in Ghana. But that was the external part of it. Mm. But if you, if you put it on a scale of 10, that probably will be 3%. But the 7% is homemade, is homegrown. Because I think that we should have realized that the quantitative, quantitative easy wasn't going to be there forever. Neither was the uh, commodity price boom going to be there forever. Mm. We have seen the cycles mm. in commodity price prices. So we should have understood that those are temporary uh, uh, situations. So we should have built strong foundations in our economy such that when those temporary uh, 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 possibilities were away, we had built foundations on which we could stand. But we didn't build those foundations. What have we done? We have run very large budgetary deficits. We have huge arrears. Um, if you look at our current account deficit for two years uh, uh, going, it's been in double digit. And I, it looks as even this year, we may probably have another double digit uh, deficit financing uh, in the current account. That means that we are overly living above our means. And whether you are an individual or a small business or a big business or a government, you cannot spend what you don't have. Now, when you do that, you get to a stage where, you know, you can, you can no longer accommodate your expense. So we have, we have created part of the problem, but there has also been some external problems that probably have accentuated uh, the situation. It, it's interesting you mentioned the issue of tapering and for many of you analysts and uh, when you're making all those um, estimations and projections as to what the allusions and the factors for which we're having all these difficulties in Africa and especially Ghana the most sufferer um, we should also take cognizance of the fact that well the US was trying to build its out, uh, itself out of a certain difficulty especially with the competition of China that that is true. And, and, and that we should make hindsight true. of. The, the, there's, the, there's a certain economist I like reading about, Professor Jeffrey Sykes. He's yes. worked with the World yes. Bank, yes. Work, I work, work, I have, et, et cetera. Yes. He, he wrote in, in his book, uh, particularly on the subject of America and the contributions of the small enterprises, that's what they call it. We call it the SME, so mm. to speak. And the, mm. the, the emergence of China and the competition that they give. In America, he said they contributed about 22 percent. Yes. And they call them startups. Yes. Now, in Ghana, I remember in 2006 and 2008, we saw the emergence of many startups. Yes. And Linking them was the needed finan financing, and so we had the uh, sprouting up of various microfinance institutions yeah. and all. Yeah. Now we're in difficulties. Yes. They are also in difficulties. Yes. What is going to happen to them? Unfortunately, um, it's already difficult for them. Uh, because unlike the, the big businesses, especially the, the multinational businesses, which have the capacity to manage volatilities. SMEs normally don't have the capacity. They also don't have the strength. They don't have the balance sheet to be able to walk to a bank and say, I'm in difficulty, bail me out now. So they, 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 they have uh, a real difficult situation. America has 22% of its economy through SMEs. We have over 80%. So if the 80% is in difficulty, that's a major issue for the country as a whole. Those which will uh, finance institutions that will provide the credit are themselves in difficulty. The, the traditional banks are, are still not in a position to deal with SMEs. I mean, they talk about a lot about SMEs. But the framework to do the understanding mm. is not there. Mm. And I believe that as part of the 
arrangements to get out of, of our present situation. Government needs to place a special emphasis on how we support SMEs quickly. Because see, if the SMEs collapse and they constitute 80% of the economy, that will be a major disaster. And we must not allow them to collapse. Now, there are two ways of looking at it. Do the SMEs understand the situation we are in? And do they know what they can possibly do themselves before seeking support outside? And are government really are able or are willing mm. to say, we need to do something for this category of investors in our country. I think we, we need to look at both. It has to be from the perspective of the SMEs themselves and from the help they can get from government and from the, the, the financial sector. But I will not place a huge emphasis on government. Because if government is servicing difficult, if government is like cannot balance its books, there isn't that extra that you can. But government can do it through policy. You see, we can do it through policy. But for instance, most of the SMEs are in competition with very cheap imports. I'm talking about the SMEs in manufacturing, for mm. instance. They can't just compete against goods from China or India or uh, Asia or whatever. They can't. These guys have secured the level of competitiveness that we don't have. We are still a factor economy, you know. But uh, how do you talk to the extent that perhaps we need a re-engineering of policy when we know that over the years, perhaps in the more recent years, we've been talking about well, perhaps the establishment of the venture capital fund, or, uh, we have, for example, also Maslock and, and some other bailouts that sometimes sure. are announced by government. Is it that the SME sector can't access or they don't have the needed um, um, financial structures to be able to access them? You see, first of all, we, we need to understand the, what drives those institutions you are talking about, the mass blocks of this world and the venture capital. The venture capital. If they have been set up to operate commercially, mm -hmm. effectively, efficiently, they ought to be able to support the SMEs. If on the other hand the driving purpose is more political which means more funds are going to, you know, customers who have a certain political uh, alliance, then the funds go with the belief that the funds will come back. And that's why the likes of Master will collapse. But the people don't believe that it's, it's a commercial transaction that they will be required to pay. They think they have supported a party uh, and they have got these loans. So a change in policy direction, what should we be looking at? We should be looking at um, using private sector intervention mm -hmm. more than public sector intervention. In what way? You, we have, uh, there's nothing wrong, and I'll give you one example. We ran for many years a plantation. You're talking about Unilever? Yes. Well, uh, well, uh, 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 Best way upon plantation. Mm. That investment was to support small farmers. The loan was provided by uh, a donor agency to the Ghana government. The Ghana government then used ADB to extend the loans to the farmers. And it was very cheap loan. Mm. But ADB didn't have the framework to deal with small, 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 small farmers. So Unilever was asked to now disperse the funds and make sure that the loans were collected. So in the plantation, you have six hectares. It, in, in, over the three, four, five years when you are farming and there are no fruits, 
you get stipend every month to look after yourself and your family. Mm. After five years, you begin to harvest. 30% is set aside. Part of it is used to uh, uh, amortize the loan. Part of it is used for reinvestment. Then 70% is used, you know, uh, to give, uh, to be given to the farmer. I can tell you that there has not been one. There was not one default, no one. And these are small, small, small farmers. I bet you, if the same system had been used direct from government agency to these farmers, there would have been 100% default. Why? Because monitoring is poor. Well, because first, the farmer will believe that this is government money, and that I'm not supposed to pay. So you're saying the attitude, the, the part mentality, of the mentality, attitude, and also the 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 concept of government, you know, largesse. Mm. Uh, the way we present these, because if you go and say to them, well, government is going to do this for you. We are going to give you small loans to buy cars, to expand your, uh, your business. If you also then don't put in a system which is non-political to ensure that the funds come back, then by, by all means, and if you don't also make sure that those who are giving the money to are not people who have supported a certain political group and that it is seen to be money which is commercial, which is being given to people who will work with it and repay, then, then you won't succeed. Because, see, we have NBSSI for small-scale industries. It's been there for many years. So why, why can't we use NBSSI? Why do we need another institution? Well, 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 we'll come to the subject of how politics perhaps uh, plays a role in the way we even formulate policies and even implement them. Now, coming to the subject still of the small-scale enterprises, uh, by the close of the year 2013, the Economic Intelligence Unit, and they have um, a monthly reports on yeah. countries, etc. Um, the annual report indicated that um, emerging sectors in southern Africa, yeah. we're talking about the small, small sectors, yeah. they were more vibrant than, and, 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 and more cost effective. They were able to also capitalize themselves yeah. and very competitive yeah. than those in West Africa as yes. well as even in Central yes. Africa. What, what makes them so? Is it because they've built their capacity and, and because they have the structures in there? And we also need to replicate that. Yes, if you look at Southern Africa, Southern Africa had more commercial farming mentality than West Africa. I lived in East Africa before, um, in the tea plantations, in the coffee plantations, in the salsa plantations. You have large farmers, but outside the large farms are small farms which are linked to the big farms. So they understand. The, 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 the new cross farm would have extended credit, would have extended uh, technical service to this small farm. He's supervised, the farmer is supervised by the new cross farmer. We don't have that here. In fact, if you look at Ghana, for instance, apart from the few firepower plantations and recently the horticulture, mm. We haven't developed that, that concept and that uh, 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 skill, those skills at all. And that is why, if you look at West Africa, our peasant farmers are on their own. You look at the cocoa industry. The farmers in the cocoa industry are on their own, virtually all year. Once in a while, the government will announce, I'm going to give you subsidized uh, 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 fertilizer. But who receives the fertilizer for distribution? Or well, the government will say, we will do free spraying, as indeed it has been announced only recently. Now, free spraying by who? And yet, if you had made it in a way that a commercial company mm. sprays all these farms for a fee, you may get a better and more effective spraying than when you go and give, you know, maybe some... Uh, Coco purchasing clerk, who is the supervisor of this, and probably will never even give the farmers the spraying machines and the chemical display. So, mm. it's 
first is institutional, second it is attitudinal, and also maybe there's a little bit of our own history. We, over the years, left our farmers on their own. If you go to Southern Africa, if you go to Eastern Africa, if you go to East and Central Africa, the farmers were almost all invariably tied to large. Mm -hmm. I, I do understand the, the, the issue about the small-scale nature yeah. of even the small-scale industries that yeah. we have. Yeah. Now, y y your, uh, your consultancy or your, yeah. your, your group, the Ishmael Yamsen and Associates, you're putting together a crash program, you yeah. call it, yeah. because it's a crisis period yeah. for these small-scale, medium enterprises, yeah. so to speak. Um, what are you going to tell them that we haven't heard before? Because crucially, they seem to be the... the the, the sections within the sector in the milieu of all these crises that have been left out. Nobody's thinking about them. You know, the, 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 uh, the topic that we will look at over the two days, uh, we termed it hope in the midst of a crisis. Because the narrative is all about doom and gloom. Most people are talking about it. They haven't even reflected on what is this all about. They probably know that the city is depreciating, but what that means to their businesses and what they can do for their businesses hasn't struck their minds. All they know is that the city is depreciating, or oh, prices are going up. But what, so what is your response of the prices going up for your business? You mean they have to take advantage of the situation? They have to take advantage. A very gloomy situation. Yes, they have to understand. One way to that the situation is very challenging. Yeah. But then let me give you an example. If you have imported, let's say, two containers uh, of Seuss, Senga, at the time you, you placed the order, the CD was to twist this 80 pesos for the sake of. The goods arrive here, the CD is three C, is three to the dollar. <laughs> Currently. Currently. Yes. Now, I expect the trader to understand immediately that. If I have to make money, mm -hmm. that my pricing should not be based on the two cities, 80 pesos, but on the two cities, on the three cities. But not only that, if I have to be able to pay all the taxes, because the, the three cities is your base cost. You have to pay your VAT, you have to pay your all. So you have to work all that through before you price your goods. So pricing is key? Pricing is key. So you're, you're saying the small scale enter enterprise person sh should be more futuristic? It's more futuristic. They need to understand, if they understand that it is not just the CD depreciating, but it has implications for his or her business, then they will sit down in their price and take all this into account. They, some of them will tell you, if, if we increase our price, we will lose our market. That is true, that may be true. But then the choice is very clear. Do you go bankrupt or do you recover your costs? Or do you change the nature of the goods you are importing? Because some goods are priced inelastic. Some are totally elastic. You change the price by one peso and all your customers will disappear. So that understanding is important, both for the small scale manufacturers and for the, uh, the, the, the pure traders. Because most of them will go bankrupt unless they have that understanding. Mm. Because you see, meanwhile, if you, if you want to borrow the money from the bank, and you have one week or two weeks or three weeks delay, that has added to your cost. So it is no longer your three cities that is important. The delay that you have, you have experienced it's also important to how you cost mm. your goods. You may even decide that, well, I, I believe that this particular sector is not viable in circumstances like this, and that I need to look at other areas. So the first thing to do is to understand the dynamics mm. of the crisis that we face today, and then try and put your business into that dynamics and say, is this business viable within these circumstances? If I think one month, two months, three months, four months, do I believe that the CD is going to stabilize? If it is going to stabilize, what do I do? If it is not, 
what so they need to understand how do you bring t bring together well even those who may be the end users of the product of these small scale enterprises um, those who manage these enterprises those who provide some level of capitalization yes. for these enterprises yes. together and tell them that well we know your goods are not as competitive as the ones that are imported we know that you're having financial challenges we know that the regulatory environment is not also conducive for you yeah. but you can still take advantage of a situation uh, just beyond what you see yes. and make some windfalls out of it if i have some money <laughs> yes yeah. so to speak yeah no you, you see it is not unusual at all not unusual no but the important thing is first to understand how the dynamics will play against your own business look the, cam the business canvas is very big it's very broad it's all very limited to maybe importing pairs of glasses. Even if you are importing glasses, there are types of glasses that you import. If you are importing this suit, there are different types of suits you can import. People begin to trade downwards. We mean, that means people begin to buy goods of lower quality, mm. of lower price, than what they were used to because, because they can no longer afford it. But if you don't understand, and you are still bringing in those goods that people are moving away from, then you will bring goods, they will be sitting on your warehouse. And uh, 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 in the end, you say, but I'm bankrupt. Mm. It reminds me of uh, uh, a very uh, well-known Ghanaian who is no more, uh, BBD Asama, who said, you know, sometimes we behave like you know, people on the dancing floor, dancing high life. When the music changes to cha-cha-cha, they are still dancing high life, and they are getting into everybody's way. So when the music changes, you should change. You should change your steps. So the economy is harsh. The parameters have changed. You can no longer continue to run your business as before. Mm. The crisis program that you, you'll be convening, uh, are you going to bring the leaders beyond yourselves within the sphere of business, uh, enterprises, the economy, etc., to speak to these um, small scale enterprises or the enterprise managers or the enterprise owners? Yeah, we will have um, economists to explain the, the dynamics of what's happening because it's not, it's not very easy and very simple because there are interrelationships. If the CD depreciates and interest go, rate goes up and inflation rises, what does that mean to my consumer? What will that mean to my customer? And how, therefore, should I respond if I want to retain my customer? So you need somebody to bring that understanding to them. Then you need to give them the practical tools now to say, if I find myself in this situation, mm. this is how I will respond. Mm. And I, I used an example uh, uh, a few days ago when, uh, uh, in, in 1996, when we were in the same situation uh, in Unilever, we decided that um, the, way, the way we track uh, our order system was itself adding to cost. So we, we said, how much cost can we take out of the business? Not how much price increase we can take. So that's a different way of looking at it. And we realized, very interestingly, that there was far too many interventions between the time we placed the order and the time the order is delivered to the customer. We had 26 interventions. We needed only four. When we remove the 22, we double the volume without increasing our price and without losing any volume whatsoever. We, in fact, made more money by responding properly to the cost pressures. Because the fact that your cost is rising doesn't necessarily mean that go and increase your prices. Was, was that the time you introduced the distribution system? Of course, that was the time. Mm. Because and you we, had the key distributors. We had the key and distributors. And there was another part of it. Mm. We were giving credit. So we were taking all the risk. But we are not in business 
taking it. We are in business to sell soap and margin. The <laughs> so you're telling us this has been done before? It has been done before. Okay. Now, for, for the small-scale enterprise person, uh, we're told, uh, according to the World Bank, that we have about 56% of them importing their raw materials. Yes. Okay. So when you have energy crisis... Yeah, you have a problem. Your CD is not stabilizing against the major currency in which you trade in, you undertake your import in, you have a huge difficulty. Yes. How do they circumvent or maneuver around these difficulties? You see, first of all, cost is not just in the price of the raw material. The cost of a manufactured product will probably come in your supply chain. Hmm. If you place an order in, a, in, a, in an economy where the currency is depreciating, you don't want to see any delays in delivery. So if we are dealing with, a, with a, a supplier who is still going to take three months to supply you goods, you'll be out of business. You should go and look for a supplier who would give you your goods within one month. By any means, you may even pay a little more. But the cost of the delay may be much, much, much higher than the little more price that you pay to get it here at one third the price. So there are many ways. You see, you, you go to people's, many of these companies, and I've been to one recently, and it's full of raw materials. And I asked the man, do you know how much it costs you for holding these raw materials? He said, no. All I know is that if I put so many things in, I can't get out. And if they see that I price it. And yet, why did the Japanese invent just-in-time manufacturing? That is why they used to be the Americans, isn't mm. it? Because you don't need to hold all that. Because first of all, you are tying down capital. Mm. So, it, so they are holding stock in the warehouse. And stock, while, was, yes. while that stock could have been converted yes. into some reserves in terms of cash exactly. somewhere. And that could have been used to trade. Yes. And not only that, he may have borrowed money to import those raw materials sitting in his warehouse. So his interest in the bank is ballooning. And yet the, the raw materials are sitting there. How you do you advise small, such small and medium scale enterprises to diversify perhaps their level of businesses in these times? Uh, I have heard you being quoted in other fora, of course across the media space, that this is the best time to make a lot of money. Yeah. That is if you have physical cash. Yes. If you have cash, you can make. I mean, for instance. Because if you're, if you're a small business and you, you, you trade in certain volumes, then you know that the rest of your cash could you be see, traded just to offset yes. whatever you see, difficulties you may be experiencing you see, in the next time around. Sometimes we, we are afraid of change. If you know that that particular trading business gives you a return of 10%, and if you put that money into a fund, you will get 32 percent. What stops you from stopping for six months or one year, investing your funds, get a lot of money, and go back to what you were doing before? Why, why should you stick to something that you know in these particular circumstances, in this particular period, if we all, if we all believe that it's short term, why don't you vary what you are doing and stay in business? It is better to remain alive than to drown yourself stuck to one way of, of, of doing So my point is that our SMEs, you know, we, we've done business with quite a number of them. And they will tell you, we, we are in Maya. <laughs> so even if he's losing money, he is not prepared to look at anything else. Mm. So my point is, they, 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 they must have innovative minds. And they should not be stuck to something they have done because their grandmother did it and their mother did it, and they too must do it. Even if the circumstances within which they did it have changed completely. So we need a lot of, I mean, you go to, I go to the Far East a lot. You, you, you go to a, a tailoring shop hmm? 
And that man has been tailoring for maybe 20, 30 years. The business was started by his father. But his father was sewing for some Englishmen and some Dutch people and some Americans. Mm. Now he would tell you, my business is in Africa. That's where the growth is. So the market is here? So the market is so here. So we have to take advantage of the market. Exactly. So what I'm saying is that these people, how do they define the growth areas in this market where they should invest their money? Invariably, you're saying that perhaps our entrepreneurs and those who manage our SMEs don't have the capacity beyond the issue of not being futuristic i i would say i wouldn't well i wouldn't say that they don't have but i think that they they lack the innovativeness you see if you go if you go to the big businesses what do they pay for they pay for creativity they pay for innovation every now and then they say the same soap you were using they call the new homo the new this, they knew that. They've changed it. But in our case, we, 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 we get stuck. We're still stereotyped. Yes, but so what I'm saying, and, and you know, I'm sure you know, <laughs> most of us, all we need to do is to see somebody do something and, and we, we also, replicate. And we want to do it. We, I did we all here, but it's when So I might also go and do it. Whether he has the skills, whether he indeed he has even the passion to do it, then he goes to do it. Well, we're still having a conversation with one-time chief executive of Unilever and, uh, well, also the managing partner of Ishmael Yamsen and Associates. And uh, they are putting together a two-day consultative crash program for small-scale enterprises here in Ghana and business entrepreneurs and business entrepreneurs as well making sure that they get as many of them as possible at uh, Clever House here in Accra and make sure they get into their minds what needs to be done in the current uh, difficulties the economy finds itself uh, if we have to get into the minds of government what do we need government to be doing currently in terms of how government needs to segment the economy, the industry, and just even within the industry, the various subsectors. I think for me, at the core of this is to stabilize the economy. Because if you don't stabilize the economy, I don't believe that you can, you can do much. So whatever that can be done to stabilize the economy, we should do it, and we should do it with a, a great sense of agency. Now, when we have done that, I think we should have a commitment to developing Ghanaian, because they are largely small, medium enterprises. We, we need to have that commitment. So we must ask, begin to ask very fundamental questions. What are their needs? We need to understand what their needs are. We must not assume that we know their needs and we can solve for them. We need to know their needs. If we know their needs, we need to sit to them because it's not a matter of you handing down solutions. Because some of the solutions may be good, but simply because they have not understood it, they may misapply, you see. And we need also to ensure that if we put those things together, we must have very robust uh, monitoring and evaluation. Because sometimes what we have done is put in brilliant uh, 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 um, exposition. exposition and just leave them there. And nobody evaluates, nobody monitors. <laughs> and, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting point you make. Which dates are you having the event? It's on the, the plenary will be on the 17th. That will be when I will make a statement and there will be a a panel of four to discuss it. But the program itself is 18th and 19th of June. So it's almost like three days. Three days. The first yeah. day, yeah. plenary, yeah. and then we have two, two days two, of days. Intense, yes. intensive discussions. Yes. Uh, the president, when he recently addressed parliament, 
talked about a shoe he was wearing, yeah. how it was uh, made in Ghana, Ghana yeah. and what the consciousness of people should be towards what is manufactured in Ghana. Yes. A very good point, yes. succinct. Yes. Um, do you think that we're having the policy drive mm. to make sure that talk or that very description is put into reality? You see, if, if, I, if I can go back to my youthful days, I have heard many people say, buy made in Ghana goods. You don't buy goods because somebody says it is made in Ghana. You, made, you buy goods because you want to buy that particular item, right? True. And then you could say, you go to a shop and you, in your mind, you already made up your mind the brand you want to buy. So I think we need to change the brand values of products made in Ghana. Most of the, of the bottled water we drink are now bottled in Ghana. Is that not true? True. We have imported bottles, and there are people buy what is made here. They have gone to the extent of creating an image of quality for those products. I think we need to help. If you go to Malaysia, the, 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 the small, medium entrepreneurs produce fantastic things, well packaged, well branded, well marketed, and very competitive. We are not, we are not making any effort to give them good packaging, to give them good presentation, to create brands for them, to create brand values for them. Who should those. do that? Then is not all the enterprise owners and, and the enterprises. But if you have an NBSSR, you are talking about SME. Of course. Who may not have the capacity as individuals to do this. To have separate departments. So you have an NBSSI, they should do this. They should help Ghanaian entrepreneurs to brand their goods. In fact, even the Ghana, the country Ghana itself, what we are doing to our economy is taking away from our brand value, the Ghana brand value. Because if you, if you mention Ghana, what, does a, what, does, what comes to the mind of an average Ghanaian today? That's what I'm talking about. So if Ghanaian manufacturers um, have brands, they have products that are good quality and well packaged, I'm sure that your SMEs will, but we need to have them. Because they, can't, they, got, they don't have the capacity as individual companies to do it. But if we build capacity in institutions, the institutions can help them. Your, your events, you talk about all these. Oh, yes. Yeah, we will. How crucial has it become for us to, as a country, as it were, become self-dependent beyond the dependence on the state? Or... Let me just put it in the more political term, government. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it is very crucial. Um, you know, I just talked about the Ghana brand value. I know there is, there is a, a department or so in the Ministry of Trade that is um, trying to develop um, a brand for Ghana, brand Ghana or something. That's the office. Oh, that it's office. It's actually called... an office and another president. Oh, okay, core brand. But it's, for me, is the values in the brand that gives the brand eh, an image. If today you phone, if you have cousins or whatever outside and you say, um, what do you know of Ghana? What do they tell you? Your city, your inflation, your this, your that. So it's taken away from the brand values of this country. If on the other hand, we run a very stable economy, a very a high growth economy, a very prosperous economy, that in itself would extend to the products made in Ghana. Because I told you I wanted this thing, it was made in South Korea. I'm sure in your mind already you think it might be of good quality. If I've told you that it was made in Ghana, you probably ask me, but who made it? You see, so you cannot, we should understand that 
the image of our country would spill over to the image of the brands and the products that we produce here. So I believe that there are institutions, we have, we have um, uh, uh, institutions, education institutions that are in the public sector that can be asked to help SMEs to create brands. It's not just a matter of ordering people to go and buy made in Ghana goods. We do have trade fairs for made in Ghana goods. We do. So I'm sure, I think every two years or so. Yeah, we, yes, we do. Every, every Actually, so. we have a number of fairs number of for fairs. Made, in, made in Ghana. And yet, soon after that, everybody is chasing up after Chinese goods and Indian goods. And we forget after the two weeks or two, one month or whatever. So beyond the issue of the values of the brands themselves, how do we sustain interest? The first of all, the brand values is at the very core of sustaining interest. Consumer interest. Consumer interest. The second is, is, is for the companies to remain competitive. And you see, that is the difficult part of it. Because you said, if I'm importing 56% of my raw materials, I need a stable currency to remain competitive. I need low level interest rates to remain competitive. If I'm in um, South Korea and I'm uh, borrowing at 6% to finance my manufacturing business, and you are here borrowing at 30% to manufacture. Definitely you will not remain you will, you will not be, competitive. Even if government puts all the duty on the goods coming from South Korea, they will still become, they will still land here, cheaper than what you, so we need to get the macro environment secured and positive, i.e. low levels of inflation, low levels of, 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 of interest rates, and very, very stable currency. Those are very fundamental, they are very core. In fact, today I can tell you that most of the companies are in, are in difficulty because Every day your cost is going up, and, and that's why uh, you will find imports still viable in our country, because we have very high VAT levels and high, in, high import duties, and yes, goods are up here cheaper. So we need to get that sorted out. And then the private sector, the SMEs, must do their bit. Let me also tell you that most of them use very old old technology. technology. It consumes, technology that consumes a lot of energy, consumes a lot of water, uh, uh, and, and in fact, uh, they don't even make sure that the labor is highly skilled mm. and therefore very productive. If you put that together, you have a non-competitive business. So there are both sides. We need to work on both sides. If we take a look at uh, energy challenges, and that also adds up to Hello. the current difficulties yeah. that we're having, the uh, SME sector seems to be um, the, the most hit, so yes. to speak. They are the hardest hit. Because if, you see, if, if, if we're a big company, you probably can buy equipment to use gas to run your factory. SME can't. Just to amortize the payment of yes, a period yes. for yourself, for your books. Yes, SME can't. The SME has to shut down when the power is off and he starts his machine, his engine. That. But for me, that may not be too big a problem. If we understood clearly mm -hmm. that within this month, you will get power for two weeks. And it is from day one to day 14. You can ask your workers to stay at home. I think you will save on transportation, you, stay, you save on food that you give them, you save and the power is off. They have come. So you have to pay them. You have to feed them in most instances. So is the, the unreliability and the uncertainty. For me, that's where the cost is. The cost is 
more in the uncertainty than in the fact that we don't have power. Mm. Mm. You see, and I think our, 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 our public sector must be must get more and more uh, into the shoes of the of the private sector. You see, because if the public sector people will begin to feel like they are the ones who have invested risk money, probably they they can empathize more and help more. But I don't think that, that today that is the case. Mm. So, so now we, we take a look at what really the contributions of the, the, the panelists mm -hmm. and the <clears throat> participants in this whole discussion. What do you hope that at the end of the day, perhaps by the next quarter, you would want to see among those who would want to come here? First of all, I think we are not, we, we, may, we are not focusing only on SMEs. Mm. We are focusing on business ex executives, but indeed the priority will be to have the SMEs. So you are broadening the We frame. are broadening the base. First of all, we expect a better understanding of the dynamics. Now, we also expect that when you, are, you now understand it, and we have given you the tools, you should be able to go back and make a difference in your organization. Now, many people have attended our courses and the feedback we've got is that, oh, uh, I, I came back and I wanted to do X, Y, Z, but I've, I've not been allowed to do it. So the companies that are sending these individuals must allow them when they come back just to demonstrate what they have brought and what they can do. You see, for instance, I mean, all my career, I had lots and lots of training. When you come back from a training program, the first thing you do is to write a report. The report will tell your boss what new things you have learned, what contributions you can make to the business, and then uh, immediately they will say, okay, uh, we'll give you space to try and experiment some of the things that you've done. Most of the innovations that in my career, in my time in Liverpool, didn't even come from the top. Sometimes it came from the people at the supervisory level, even be below the supervisory level. Mm. People who have been to course and they come and they say, when we went out there, this is what we saw. Can we try mm. it here? So the companies that bring people should not simply bring them because the topic sounds attractive. When they come back, please help them, you know, allow them, you know, to, to tell you at least what, what they came uh, 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 to, 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 to study. Mm -hmm. So they can make a country. But we expect a better understanding and therefore a better way of managing. That is it. Uh, and, it's all, and it's all part of building on not only HR capacity, no. but also contributing significantly to the way businesses are run. Around, yes. Mm. In fact, that is more, um, more the case because we believe that if people have an understanding of stable economy and unstable economy and what they should do when the economy is stable and what they should do when the crisis begins to loop, we may have better businesses, more solid, eh? and, and to deal with volatilities. But today, most companies have panicked. So the narrative is all about, you know, we're going to shut down our businesses. But it should be about what is the challenge in it? What is in there that Reinvention, I, exactly, innovativeness? Exactly. What can I do better and differently? As we round up our discussions, would you say that perhaps uh, in the more recent decades, um, the big businesses around, because you're going to have big business leaders around here as well, uh, have been able to transfer their knowledge, technology and capacities or expertise, just to put it in that form, to the up and coming, the SMEs? Oh yes, I mean, I... I uh, Maybe I've been lucky, but I've, I've had relationship with Sun Chartered Bank, with MTN, with Unilever, with Wilma, which is the, 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 the largest oil palm plantation uh, uh, management group in the world. And I've seen the 
the the speed with which they transfer skills and competences. I mean, if you take Stanchat for now, we have over 100 of our staff all over the world learning different ways of banking. But every time they come back, they are different. They are simply admirable to watch. So, and I think that those people who find their way there, and that is a, that's a good thing. When they come back, they are pushed <laughs> by those who don't have the capacity to, to give them that kind of transformed management skills. So we don't only train for ourselves, mm. we also train for the economy. But my advice to the SMEs, they should not be afraid to hire better skilled people and pay them, and well. Pay them well. Because you, you cannot expect good results from people who don't have the skills to deliver good results. We say garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> if you put, and those who make the difference, what makes the difference in any organization are the people. It's not the plants and equipment sitting there. It's the people who are there who will make the difference. I'll tell you one story to finish. Please do. One day I was walking through the factory in Unilever. I stood at this line. It was the Prato oil packing line. I tell this story all the time because it fascinates me. It was filling four bottles per second. Bam, 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 bam. Four bottles. So I asked the question, because I saw two spaces there for two nozzles, which had been left vacant by the manufacturers. So I asked the question, well, why can't we have six nozzles instead of four? Everybody said, oh, but that's how the machine was, man, was made. It cannot be done. We would, we would damage the, the plant. I said, is that so? So I said to the, the, the team, but we work in teams there. Can, you, can I give you a challenge? They said, can you put two more nozzles on this? They give us two months. So I went away. I forgot about it. Six weeks they came back and said, we have done it. Can you come and have a look? So I go down to the factory and they are filling six bottles. Instead of four. Instead of four. Just two months before. Just two months. That's six weeks from the time oh, I was. Oh, six weeks. It. Yes. I gave, they gave me two, two months. months. But they finished up and six. Finished. These are not graduates from KNE West. No. These are people from our polytechnics who did it. And they had increased capacity by 50% just in six weeks. If we had brought some engineers from Germany, do you know how much it would have cost us? First, they would have taken the North back to Germany, so you stop production for as long as. So sometimes the SME should, should have the courage to test these people and challenge them. Mm. Again, just give, uh, give our viewers uh, uh, just a roundup of what your event is, the name of the event, when it's taking place. The name of the event is Hope in the Midst of Crisis. That we should not lose hope. It shouldn't be just doom and gloom. That even in this crisis period, there's a lot that we can do for ourselves, both as business people, as individuals, and even for government, because this, this crisis must challenge the government. Because as I said earlier, if we had learned the lessons of 92, 96, 2000, 2004, no, because that's why Sasab Mafu should be glorified. <laughs> because the only finance minister so far who stand, we, we went into elections and said they didn't destroy the country. 2008, 2012. If we, had learned, if we just say we now have lessons to learn and that we will stop doing those things that destroy our economy, that will be a huge change in our lives. Okay, and the date is? The date is 17th of plenary, 18th and 19th of June, 
uh, two full days okay. to uh, come. <laughs> All right, and the venue is the Clever House yeah. here in Accra. And uh, for many of you, perhaps you may know uh, Data Bank and Tigo, they are just sandwich in between. The Clever House is the venue for uh, Ishmael Yamsen and Associates uh, Crisis um, Group Meeting for business leaders as well as those who tend to manage and own small and medium scale enterprises. So the 17th, 18th, and 19th. Thank Please you. do come have a date with Ishmael. Yamsen and Associate, and um, I've been speaking to the man himself, uh, one-time chief executive of Unilever. Mr. Ishmael Yamsen is the managing partner for Ishmael Yamsen and Associates, and he's made a number of contributions to public discourse and contributions to public policy and the subjects of the economy and business. Well, uh, we've been having this very discussion at uh, the venue where we're going to have that very crunch event, the Clever House here in Accra. It's sandwiched between Tigo and also Data Bank, just um, opposite the Accra Workers College. For many of you who know that very venue, it should be very easy for you to locate. Okay, let me just give you one more uh, location idea after all. After all, I'm a Ghanaian and my directions would have to be on point. Just close to the Holy Spirit Cathedral, you get to that very bend. <laughs> You ask of Tigo and Data Bank, just sandwich in between them. Very easy. I think that's the most easiest. And we say thank you very much. Thanks for speaking to us. Much. We hope to have you sometime thank again. You. Thank and uh, it's not it's not easy and it's, it's very difficult to have you. So thank we you. say thank you, thank Mr. Ishmael Yamsen.